Hello, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. There'll be some fine weather in the south and the east today with even a few warm, sunny spells elsewhere. It's going to be increasingly blustery and increasingly showery. Some low cloud at first across western parts and we've got this area of rain moving into northern and western England as well as Wales. And that'll tend to fizzle as we go into the afternoon and as it approaches the Midlands. Meanwhile, Scotland and Northern Ireland will be very unsettled with a gusty wind. Areas of rain followed by showers and sunny spells. Some of these showers will be lively. But ahead of all that, East Anglia and the southeast keep the sunny spells and highs of 19 or 20 Celsius. Into the evening and the showers and longer spells of rain tend to push eastwards and actually it turns mostly dry once again across England and Wales, eastern Scotland as well. Showers continuing for much of for the rest of Scotland as well as Northern Ireland along with a gusty wind. Where we've got lighter winds elsewhere it's going to be a chilly night, certainly a cold night compared with the last few nights with temperatures dipping below 5 Celsius in places. But a bright start to the day on Sunday. We've got plenty of sunshine for England, Wales, southern and eastern Scotland. Showers from the word go across central and western Scotland, as well as parts of Northern Ireland. And then those showers develop more widely across the rest of Scotland into northern England, parts of Wales. It stays bright, though, towards the southeast. Here we'll have highs of 15 Celsius, feeling cooler but pleasant enough. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. Mark White was saying there, Sue, that he thinks it's getting worse. And again, you were nodding along to that. You've, you've seen this over decades. Situation is sprawling along the coast, more people, yes. and the danger is ramping up. Definitely, um, because the, the numbers and the money is... It's run like a military operation. Mm. I mean, I've been told that by the National Crime Agency and I don't need to be told it by them to know it. It is meticulous because there's so much money involved. So they're, they're marshalling migrants here, the gangs, they're controlling the gangs, and there will be a Mr a Kingpin. Mm. You know, in some city far away in Erbil or even in Paris or in Brussels, who never goes anywhere near the beaches. It's like a Ponzi scheme, really. Yeah. With that in mind, um, there's such vested interest, such money, such demand, a never-ending string of demand of people who yes. want to come here. People How are on already earth? on their way, remember. Yeah. If we stop them now, they're already leaving... There's people leaving the Sudan now are going to reach the only place they want to get to, the French beaches, to get to the UK. They'll arrive in two and a half years' time. And so, you see, they're on their way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I, um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure, I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed, just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. Very good morning to you. I'm Ben Leo, alongside Olivia Utley, and this is Saturday Morning Live. 
Great to have your company this morning. All our top stories coming today, including this bombshell breaking news from Sydney of a major incident declared after reports that multiple people, including a nine-month-old baby, have been stabbed in a shopping centre. We have all that and the rest of the day's top stories with writer and comment commentator Candice Holdsworth and singer and TV personality Ben Ofeidu. And it's not long until the Grand National, one of the most iconic horse races, kicks off in Aintree later today. Along with the glitz and glamour comes a huge amount of gambling. We'll be exploring the highs and the terrible lows of the betting world with former gambling addict and ex-England goalkeeper Peter Shilton, CBE. And of course, like every week, we'll be meeting our greatest Britain. And today, it's a man who believes in connecting people through music. We'll be hearing all about his great work very shortly. Good morning to you. And if you're just waking up this morning, this breaking news from Sydney, Australia, where a man, perhaps two men, have been stabbing uh, innocent bystanders in a shopping centre as they were out on Friday night. Uh, you're looking at live pictures now from down under. There's reportedly four to five people killed. A nine-month-old baby has been involved. Uh, unfortunately, the, the youngster is receiving surgery. Um, so fingers crossed that um, uh, that goes well. But we're going to be live on the ground from Sydney with reporters, all the major updates uh, and, of course, information on the suspects as well. We want to hear from you this morning on all of our topics, Sydney and everything else we're covering, gbnews.com forward slash your say. But before we do anything else, let's get your news headlines with Sam Francis. Very good morning from the newsroom just after 10 o'clock and we start with a roundup of that breaking news from Sydney uh, this morning where we're hearing that a major police operation is underway following those reports of a stabbing spree at a shopping centre near Bondi Beach. At least five people are confirmed to have been killed in that attack which we now know took place at the busy Westfield Centre in the area of Sydney. We understand a police officer in the area at the time confronted the male suspect and shot him dead. That was as he faced her and raised a knife. At this stage, police believe the offender did act alone in that attack. Now, if you're watching on television, you can see here these live pictures coming to us from the scene outside the shopping centre in Sydney, the New York, the New, the New South Wales police force rather, have confirmed that seven people who were stabbed during that attack have now been taken to a number of hospitals across the city. And as we heard at the top of the hour, that does include a nine-month-old baby. Earlier, officers could also be seen in aerial footage searching the shopping centre's rooftop car park. And we heard from the Assistant Commissioner, Anthony Cook, moments ago, who gave us this update. Our hearts go out uh, to all of them, uh, as they do to anyone touched by this terrible incident this afternoon. I do not have information in relation to the offender. I do not know at this stage who he is. You would, be, uh, you would understand this is quite raw. Uh, inquiries are very new and we are continuing to make attempts to identify the offender in this matter. During the afternoon in Sydney, multiple police and paramedics were called to that scene where reports of a lone knifeman uh, were given, stabbing people indiscriminately, eyewitnesses said. That was just after three o'clock in the afternoon, local time. Uh, if you're watching on television, here's how witnesses described the scene moments ago. I, I didn't see him properly. I was running. But um, it's just, it was insane. It was insanity. I wasn't expecting it. Uh, some guy running around stabbing people. Seems pretty random. Probably a terrorist attack. We saw all these people running towards us and then we heard a shot. That there, the accounts of witnesses from Sydney following that alleged knife attack in a shopping centre near Bondi Beach. Uh, as I said, the major police operation is still unfolding. We will, of course, bring you more on that throughout the morning as we get it. To other news now, the US president expects Iran will attack Israel, he says, sooner rather than later. That's after officials in the US said threats from Tehran were real and credible. However, Joe Biden had this warning. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. 
and Iran will not succeed. Thank you very much. The Iranian government's promised revenge for an Israeli airstrike on its consulate in Damascus that killed top commanders. In response, though, the U.S. is now moving additional assets into the Middle East. Countries including India, France and Poland have also warned their citizens against travelling to the region. Back here in the UK, the Chancellor says he is ready to cut taxes and to bet on growth. That's after the economy grew by 0.1% in February. The Office for National Statistics also revised January's figure, pushing it up to 0.3%. Writing in the Daily Express, Jeremy Hunt says Britain has done the hard years and the economy is bouncing back. But Labour says most people aren't feeling any of the benefits, with low growth and higher taxes under the Conservative government. The chief executive of the NHS in England has called out what she's called unacceptable abusive behaviour that doctors and nurses face in the workplace. Amanda Pritchard says the health service needs to stamp out abusive behaviour and that it shouldn't be exempt from its own Me Too movement. According to a major survey, there were 80,000 reports of NHS staff in England being sexually harassed while at work last year. Reports were more prevalent among ambulance staff, nursing staff and healthcare assistants. Well, we've heard this morning that the Royal Navy has seized nearly £33 million of drugs from traffickers in the Indian Ocean. Around 3.7 tonnes of substances, including heroin, crystal meth and cannabis, were taken by crews aboard HMS Lancaster. The ship was on its first security patrol when its Wildcat helicopter spotted a suspicious boat in the area. Labour claims that Britain's roads now have 100 times as many potholes as there are craters on the moon. Figures estimate that there were more than one million potholes in the UK last year, which can cause serious damage to cars. The party's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, says Rishi Sunak is living on another planet after failing to fix the problem. The government, though, says it is investing billions of pounds to improve our roads. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. More to come in the next hour. Until then, you can, of course, sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good morning to you. Ben and Olivia with you on Saturday Morning Live. Now, the clear top story this morning is, of course, the major incident in Sydney uh, with reports that multiple people have been stabbed. Uh, I believe six people are declared dead currently, including the attacker. Let's get more now from GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White, who joins us. Mark, what's the latest, please? Well, this incident, every bit as bad as we had feared, with five people who were killed by this attacker. The attacker himself shot dead by a police officer, a lone female police officer, an inspector who was on patrol nearby and responded to this incident at the Westfield shopping centre in Bondi Junction. She entered the shopping centre just after 3.20 in the afternoon to these reports that a man was stabbing multiple people. She managed to catch up with this individual who, according to the police, turned round with a knife raised and at that point the inspector opened fire and shot dead this uh, assailant. Now we're also being told by the emergency services, Hillstone. this time New South Wales Ambulance Service, that they treated and assessed six people at the scene, including of course uh, the attacker as uh, deceased. In addition to that, eight people now we're told, eight people. OK. We've lost Mark's sound there, but you can get from what he's saying a bit that... Sorry, Mark, go on. We just lost you for a second there. Yeah, so the uh, eight people taken to hospital, among those uh, was uh, a child, a nine-month-old baby, according to one eyewitness who spoke to Nine News, who spoke about actually being handed the baby by the mother... Uh, who had been stabbed. Uh, he noticed the baby was injured as well. He tried to stem the bleeding until the paramedics arrived on scene and managed to take that child 
to the hospital. Now, we've been hearing from Assistant Commissioner Cook from New South Wales Police. I believe that we do have uh, some of that news conference that he uh, gave just on the steps of the Westfield Shopping Centre. I'm advised that there are five victims who are now deceased as a result of the actions of this offender. Uh, there are more than several other people who have been conveyed to hospital. A number of those are in serious and or critical conditions. Now, in terms of the suspect, uh, we don't know an awful lot at this stage. Uh, the police say they haven't yet been able to determine a motivation for this attack, but they're ruling absolutely nothing out, including terrorism. But they also add they haven't yet found anything and certainly nothing at the scene that points to a motivation. Uh, the individual, uh, he looked to be about uh, in his 30s, uh, maybe early 40s, um, of kind of medium build with uh, a short beard, uh, wearing a football top and uh, football shorts, swarthy complexion. Um, and he was going seen on CCTV uh, throughout the shopping centre, various bits of CCTV that the media have got a hold of that's been released now on social media as well, showing him running through this shopping centre on a busy Saturday afternoon. Of course, the, the first day of the school holidays uh, in Australia, in that area, we're told as well. So a lot of families out in this shopping centre and he was clearly seen running up to uh, people with young children as well at that time. Very much. I think we and have... just told that the Australian Prime Minister is giving a news conference. Let's listen in. Yep. But it was also witness to the humanity and the heroism of our fellow Australians, our brave police, our first responders, and of course everyday people who could never have imagined that they would face such a moment. And some of the footage is quite extraordinary. Staff for whom this should have been a normal shift, shoppers peacefully going about their lives, and yet for these Australians their first instinct in the face of danger was to help someone else. That is what we hold on to tonight as Australians. That's confirmation of who we are. Brave, strong, together. The work of the New South Wales Police and the Australian Federal Police is ongoing. But what we can say for sure tonight is this. To any Australian affected by this tragedy, Every Australian is with you. Before I hand to Commissioner Kershaw, uh, I can say that I've also spoken with uh, the New South Wales uh, Acting Premier uh, tonight, and the Commonwealth stands ready to assist in every way possible. Commissioner Kershaw. Thanks, Prime Minister. Tonight, the AFP is supporting New South Wales Police investigate a mass casualty event in Sydney. The AFP has deployed AFP members to the crime scene and we've offered our full specialist capability such as digital forensics. It is too early to determine a motive and it would be unhelpful to speculate. I want to reassure the community that the AFP is providing New South Wales Police with whatever support is required. And tonight I've also spoken with the New South Wales Police Commissioner and the Di Director General ASIO and finally, I would like to give my condolences to the victims and families out there. Given Dad. your opening remarks, I don't know how you expect to address this in part. Given the attack was online, a set of records in East Pacific, I think there are people asking about whether terror is part of this attack. Do you have any information about whether there was any terror? Motivation. Having spoken with the New South Wales Police Commissioner, at this stage it's too early to uh, give that assessment. Uh, however, all the agencies, the right agencies, are working together to make that assessment. Then would you comment on that, given that there are already a lot of people speculating about that as a possible motivation here? What's your response to that, motiva that speculation? I think the AFP Commissioner uh, has made it clear uh, that speculation 
uh, certainly not from uh, myself, would be uh, unhelpful at this time. Uh, we should allow the investigators to go about their work. Uh, the police, I've also had a discussion uh, tonight with the Director General of ASIO. Uh, the motive at this stage is unknown. And we will, of course, uh, continue to update uh, the Australian public as more information is known. Commissioner, just how serious is this incident in Australia? It's very serious, uh, given uh, the amount of people that have been harmed. And, uh, you know, it's something that we take seriously. We, we do, uh, sadly, exercise for these kinds of events. And what I would say, the police and the emergency services on the ground there are doing an incredible job. And uh, also working with victims and trauma, um, quite some incredible work from all the services. Can you say anything about how many AFP resources have been mobilised because of this? Not at this stage, but it's hard to say because you have people at the scene, but you then have the support in the, in the back end of our business. So a lot of people are working on this right now, and we work together. Uh, and New South Wales Police have the lead on this. And Dan, what would you say to Australians who are worried about other attacks, whether this may lead to other attacks or spur them on, whether there should be any concern about further threats? Look, it certainly is, uh, is, is my view that we should allow uh, this investigation to take place. Uh, it, it would appear uh, that this person has elect, acted alone. Uh, the motives are not known yet, and uh, speculation on that would not be uh, helpful uh, at this time. Uh, but we have been uh, clear and transparent, and I know that the New South Wales Police, as well as now uh, the AFP, have made information available uh, as, as a priority because we understand that the Australian public uh, will be very shocked by this event. Our heart goes out to them. And I think also, uh, in, in conclusion, can I say, I spoke before about the bravery uh, that has been exhibited here. Uh, the bravery of uh, the police officer uh, who she entered uh, the uh, proceedings that were taking place, obviously very dangerous, uh, by herself. Uh, she is certainly a hero. There is no doubt that she saved lives uh, through her action. And it is a reminder that uh, those people who wear uniform uh, are people who uh, rush to danger, not away from it. And I give thanks to every, every one of them. Uh, for the actions that they've taken up to now and the actions that they will take over the coming days, which will be a difficult period as well. Thank you. So the Australian Premier, Anthony Albanese, they are giving that news conference alongside uh, the Australian Federal Police and saying, really concluding uh, his remarks there with praise for that police inspector who was on sole patrol nearby uh, to the shopping centre, rushed into that shopping centre on her own, confronted the attacker and killed that attacker. He said that uh, she is uh, in incredibly brave and shows uh, just what the police do in running towards danger. And of course, we know from attacks in the past that the modus operandi now of those who carry out, especially these multiple uh, casualty attacks, they are trying to cause as much in the way of harm as possible. So police won't negotiate anymore. They rush forward and try to neutralise the threat. Well, this officer did that on her own. Um, other uh, sort of notes of interest, I think, in that uh, news conference uh, was the refusal, I think, of the Prime Minister to go into any detail on the potential motivation at this stage. It may be that they just uh, are too early on in the investigation to know for sure 
whether there was any kind of uh, motivation uh, behind what that motivation might have been. Uh, but clearly, in the absence of any confirmation from the authorities, there is speculation. But at this stage, what they are confirming is an absolutely horrific incident that unfolded with um, five innocent people killed, the attacker killed, and eight others now in hospital in serious and some in critical condition. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for that. Now, we're joined here by writer and commentator Candice Holdsworth and singer and TV personality Ben Alfredo. Candice, Ben, I mean, what really struck me about that press conference was the bravery of that female police officer who shot the suspect and was an eyewitness account saying that if she hadn't shot him, he would have carried on. He was on a rampage. I mean, it's terrifying, isn't it? It's amazing to think of her. I mean, in those circumstances, you do just go into fight or flight. And she obviously just... Her fight response kicked in and it was incredible. And she went in on her own. She had no idea what she was facing. I mean, it almost... It makes me feel tearful, but thank goodness for someone like her. Thank goodness. And thank goodness it does now sound as though there was just the one attacker. For a little bit this morning, it sounded as though there were, yeah. there were two, but it, it was an isolated mm -hmm. attacker. But, I mean, that'll be cold comfort to the people in Sydney now trying to escape the, 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 the surrounding streets of that Westfield shopping centre. No, exactly. I mean, to the police officer, to, to the ladies, up for the ladies. Mm -hmm. So that's an amazing thing. Um, yeah, I always get really scared when things like this happen um, because I think that in the months to follow after, everywhere in the world, there's going to be tension. And we always worry. We don't quite know the motives of it. But, you know, I suppose they suspect it's terrorism, but we don't know. And, uh, you know, everywhere, we just, you know, it, I always fear about copycat incidents. I know this sounds like a bit too premature to say, but that's what always scares me about stuff like this. It's just completely frightening. Well, it's, it's a good point to make. I mean, we don't know the motive for this incident this morning. We don't know mm -hmm. if it's terrorism. It could have just been some you know, some uh, some lone person. Yes. However, this week we did have threats from Islamic State on uh, football matches across Europe, the Champions yeah. League games. Arsenal yeah. played Bayern Munich at the Emirates in North London yeah. on, was it Tuesday or Wednesday night? There was uh, an increased police presence there. So, yeah, we don't know the motive for this. Um, to be honest, let's hope it's not terrorism because... Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and let's just hope it's a, it's, it's a lone wolf situation because, as I said, we've been hearing the growing threat from Islamic State. There's all the... So, um, situation with Gaza and yeah. uh, Israel. Yeah. So uh, Iran, the last thing we want, especially on Grand National Weekend, is a heightened sense of you know fear uh, in the northern hemisphere. You know, let alone down under. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And in Australia, actually, the terror level threat is a little bit lower mm. than it is over here in the UK, which mm. uh, feels a little bit alarming. But but as we've said, we do not know what the motivations are yet. And mm. Anthony Albanese, there, the the uh, the Australian Prime Minister, was very keen not to not speculate. to speculate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm saying yeah. Um, OK, we're going to stick with this uh, during the show. Eyewitnesses, we're going to go back to the live feeds as well and give you all the updates as they happen, including the situation on that nine-month-old baby who was stabbed. The, the youngster is still alive, uh, as we understand at the moment, and is undergoing an operation in hospital, so fingers crossed for uh, that little boy or girl. But up next, we're going to be sitting down with the legendary Peter Shilton, the former England goalkeeper, about the dangers of gambling. It is, of course, Grand National Weekend. Lots of you are going to be having a flutter today. Are you, Olivia? Are you prone for a, a uh, I'm not, actually, but my husband is there at the Grand National. Oh, lucky setting. him. I know. Watch in a, in a, in in a box or in, in the... a box. Oh, there yeah, we go. How mine. the other half live, eh? <laughs> right, stick with us. Lots more to come. This is Saturday Morning Live on GB News, Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30.
It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hill's who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so been... times have changed drastically. Well, welcome back to Saturday Morning Live and don't forget to keep sending me and Ben questions about the topics in the news this week and we'll chat through them with our panel and guests. Yes, we will get to them. So it's gbnews.com forward slash your say. I can see them flying in, but when we get time, we will get to them and uh, we'll see what you've been saying. Um, now, of course, today uh, is the return of one of the biggest sporting spectacles in the world. My favourite, they call it the greatest show on turf. It's the Grand National. And whilst it can be seen as a, a bit of fun, I guess, with millions of people across the country putting on bets for the races, uh, for others, it can be a difficult time of the year. Yes, and gambling charities are urging those that are struggling with addiction to seek help and advice this weekend. Of course, it can be, you know, you and me might put a fiver on the Grand National once a year, but some people struggle every single day with this. Very hard to get the balance right. Yes, exactly. Well, who best to speak to you now about this uh, and the dangers of gambling than former England goalkeeper and a hero of mine, Peter Shilton. Good morning, Peter. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. Good. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, look, as we, we mentioned in the introduction, it's uh, for most people, it's uh, uh, you know, a great sporting occasion. It's iconic. It's a historic race. We go down the bookies and put a couple of quid on, maybe. Uh, you'd pick a horse based you know, on the colours or the name, perhaps. But for some people, and including you, and I'll let you, you know, talk about your own experiences, but for some people, it's an occasion where we have to be a bit conscious about uh, digging up past habits. Yes, I mean, as you've just alluded to, it's it's a fantastic event, always has been, and it brings people who would not normally have a bet throughout the year to have a couple of quid or a five run on the national. It's 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 something that's been traditional. I suppose the only other race would be the Derby that you would, you know, look on it as the same way. Um, but of course, you know, it it brings up the fact that, you know, there are an awful lot of people out there now who are addicted. You know, we're addicted to many things in life these days, but gambling is, is one of the biggest. And certainly, you know, there is a lot of misery to not just the gambler, but to the people around a gambler, you know, family, friends, uh, et cetera, who probably have lent money. And, uh, you know, it affects... A lot of people, um, not just the gambler, and obviously I had the, the problem for, for 45 years. You know, um, certainly it started out as a hobby with me, but it, it grew into much more because, you know, you sit there and, it, it, you know, you get the excitement and everything else, and then at the end of the day, you look back and you think, oh, I don't think I should have lost all that. And it's just a, a natural reaction to a gambling uh, addiction. 
I think one thing which is so often difficult for, for, for gamblers is that it's very difficult to get your get your way out of it. Once you are a, a gambling addict and your sort of credit ratings are uh, through the floor, then trying to get trying to get back up again, being able to you know buy a house, get a mortgage, etc., can become very very difficult indeed. Do you think sort of the government and gambling charities are doing enough to to to, to help with that problem? Yeah, well, money fuels gambling, and if you're earning a lot of money, you know, you can get away with it because gamblers are secretive. They hide things all the time. You know, they only tell people when they have a win. Uh, but as mm. we know, the majority, vast majority will always lose. And, um, you know, uh, you know, that that's the way it is. I, listen, I don't I think we've been waiting for a white paper by the government on gambling to to be brought out so we can see what new legislations are going to be. You know, in that in that white paper, you know, obviously we next season the Premier League are taking the gambling off the front of Premier League teams, um, but then you hear it and they may put it on the sleeve or on the back. So yeah. it's it's yeah. a start, it's a start. But there's far more, I think, in terms of you know the gambling uh, advertising. You know, it's in people's faces all the time. Uh, you know, their 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 code of conduct. They're they're getting fined continuously gambling firms for, for breaking the rules and letting people who, who they know, you know, probably shouldn't have the money mm. they have on. And uh, there's all those sort of things going on now. So, that need Peter, to be sorry, out. sorry to interject. Can you just remind us of your own story, your experience? You've spoken previously about how you lost millions of pounds gambling. Mm. I think at one point you were spending, is it 18,000 pounds a month on punting? I mean, what kind of things were you betting on and, and how did you pull yourself out of that hole? I know you credited your wife, Steph, uh, yeah. with, with helping you. Yes, very much so. Well, at the time, you, you you just don't, you don't look at what you're losing. You just, you know, you want to win. And, uh, you know, and if you've got quite a bit of time on your hands, which some sportsmen do, you know, they, they do their job, like play football or cricket or whatever it is, and then they train and they have a lot of rest time and, Sometimes that rest time can turn into, you know, what we talk, you know, talk about addictions. So, you know, you want to be on the high. And I think that's the thing. When I look back, you know, you wake up and all you're thinking about, in my case, it's mostly horse racing. Mm. You know, I'd studied the, I'd study the paper and the whole day would be gone. And at the end of the day, you look back and you think, well, that was a day wasted. All I've done is lose money. And it was nine years, over nine years ago, that uh, I met my wife. Well, my wife, Steph, helped me overcome my addiction. And the penny dropped. And, um, you know, I realised that, you know, there's more to life. I've been wasting my life. I've put a lot more pressure on myself than I needed to. And now I wake up and I'm thinking, oh, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And mentally, you know, you're so much better off. And financially, you're so much better off. Because every time you you earn money, you keep it. Uh, a gambler it will always be short short of money, and, and there is not everybody's um, you know uh, an addictive gambler, but it's getting more and more people who are men, women, and children. Well, as you said, it's so prominent in the advertising. You watch a football match today, and you've got uh, bookies adverts, you've got um, adverts on front of the shirts, the sleeves. Everywhere, the training kits even have specialist bookies sponsoring them. So, Peter, as a as a uh, reformed addict, and an, I know addicts take it a day at a time, but what's your advice to anyone today who maybe doesn't see themselves as an addict, but um, perhaps wants to, you know, curtail their gambling a bit and is conscious that today is a big betting day? Well, you will get addicts who will probably have a bit more on the Grand National than they should do. But, you know, that that's part of the territory, you know. I mean, I, I just think my advice to an addict now, you know, look, face up to the fact that you're not going to win. There's only a very, very small percentage of people win at gambling. You're not going to win in the long term. You know, you are wasting your time and money. And you're probably going to get yourself in debt. So seek help. Seek out help. There's plenty of help out there. Uh, my wife wife now works for Gordon Moody, which is a... Which is a a big charity, and she she's got a new service which helps the, you know, the family members around an addict when they go into treatment because there's a lot of debris left, and the addict needs to walk out into a better situation. Mm. And um, there's there's a lot more going on than people realise. So get help, seek help, and um, and start on the road to a better life and a happier life and a more prosperous life because you're going to be far better off 
financially. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. By, by giving, well, thank you, know. you so I mean, much for that, Peter. I love the bet. Yeah, I mean, I love horse racing. I always have, you know, um, and, you know, the horses love it. They're fit, they're trained up, they get well looked after. Um, so I, I love that sport, but it's the gambling side of it, it goes with it. Yeah. Well, as you say, Peter, I mean, for some people it's easy, for some people it really isn't so easy at all. And I think it's really inspiring to hear from someone who was in that hole and managed to get themselves out of it. So thank you very much for Thanks, Peter. telling us your story. Pleasure. Pleasure. Right, coming up, we're going to stick with this breaking incident in Sydney, the shopping centre stabbing spree. We understand six people have died, including the perpetrator. We heard from the uh, Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, who said that a female police officer was brave enough and courageous to run into danger, apprehend the suspect and shoot him dead. Also, we'll try and get an update for that nine-month-old baby who was stabbed and is currently, I think, undergoing surgery in hospital. Uh, all that and more after the break. Stick with us. proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of the sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke, and there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes? Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association, which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of companies fixing things that weren't broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very pinkish and quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... Uh, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, going crazy. That's, that's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Welcome back and a very good morning to you. It's Ben and Olivia on Saturday Morning Live. Uh, we're just going to get some emails now from you on this incident in Sydney, of course, the breaking news that multiple people have been stabbed in a shopping centre. They were out and about uh, shopping on a Friday night. 
in uh, Australia when a, a lone attacker uh, went round with a knife. Uh, five or six people, or at least five people, are confirmed to have died. And a nine-month-old baby, can you believe it, has been stabbed and currently undergoing critical surgery in hospital. June says, good morning to you, June. Thank goodness that the lone female police officer was armed and thus uh, able to stop him. Here in the UK, she would not have been routinely armed. Uh, and Donald says, a big well done to the amazing Aussie policewoman who shot dead the, the uh, perpetrator. That's the way to deal with this type of situation. This lunatic is no longer a threat to anyone. Yeah, a lot of you are very impressed by the bravery of that female police officer. And then Mary says, I find myself being wary when out in the day and I live in the north. I don't feel safe walking around in the shops. I don't feel safe on the bus either. What must the people of London think? I think that is the thing. You, you can't help sort of imagining what it would be like if it had happened in London. Well, quite. I mean, we, we mentioned a bit earlier how Islamic State had threatened uh, football matches in the UK this week, Arsenal against Bayern Munich. There was an increased police presence. Uh, and you just wonder, you know, the situation with Israel, Gaza, Iran, tensions are rising high. So I'm not surprised many of you at home feel, you know, worried about that kind of thing. There's a lot of discussion about, about whether our police officers too should be armed on a, on a routine basis. Lynn says, dreadful Australian news, my heart goes out to them. In this country, the police officer would probably have been arrested. Mm, yeah, interesting point. OK, we're going to stick with that throughout the show. Uh, expert witnesses, we're going to have reporters on the ground, live shots as well, and of course, all the updates that go with it. Uh, slight change of gear now. Uh, with the weather getting warmer... Well, getting warmer, has it? We oh, had, it's getting warmer today and We yesterday. had one day yesterday <laughs> of about 20 minutes of sunshine. And well, everyone... we haven't really seen the weather yet. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, look, it won't be long before we're in festival season, so beer tents, I guess, music and, of course, huge <laughs> queues for the toilet. And it's an age-old problem for women particularly, who often find they spend more time queuing for the loo than at the event itself. But perhaps the answer is finally here. Two women from Bristol think so. They've invented what they say is a revolution in the female toilet. Uh, our southwest of England reporter Jeff Moody, who else, uh, was dispatched to find out more. It's all right for us blokes. We can be in and out of the loos in a matter of seconds, but not so for women. It's very frustrating having to queue, seeing men come in and going, and we have to wait to go in here. Um, also, there's a the thing about men can just do it and not have to sit on anything or hover in an uncomfortable position. Introducing Hazel and Amber. After spending too much of their lives in loo queues, they've invented a toilet that lets women spend a penny as quickly as you can say ladies urinal. And so we were really propelled forwards by women saying this must happen. So we made prototypes, we gained investment, we manufactured the product in the UK, um, and then we started, uh, we actually launched in 2022 yeah. at Glastonbury. So that was like, we went to the most influential event, so it would just trickle down to all the other events. Trickling down is the key to the success of the girls' invention, but I'm not sure I'm the best one to explain all this. Let's ask a festival goer, who is their number one fan. Um, but recently I went to Glastonbury Festival a couple of years ago and they had these, uh, these new Pequal, Pequals, I think they're called, and they're more of a cabin, they're very comfortable to be able to squat down and they're just a much better setup, no paper cardboard bits that can go horribly wrong and much less margin for error. Um, it's really nice, it's in a big open space, so everyone's kind of chatting away about how brilliant this is that we've got a new innovation to help us go to the toilet without getting dirty and queuing and everything. So, yeah, re it's a really, really nice experience. I wish I, they had them more often. I've only ever seen them at Glastonbury Festival. I really need to pee. Long key. It's called Pequal, equal rights for people Why that pee. And the girls think, Our with a change of mindset, minutes. this could make them flush. It's almost um, driven by ease of use, because instead of going for a 30-minute toilet queue, you can use a Pequal and you're in and out. It's almost driven by convenience, yeah. is the word I was going for. It's the word I'd go for, too. This script writes itself. 
We did actually just win the best toilet of the year award, mm -hmm. and it felt That's good. Right. Dream country, <laughs> country bus. Yeah, <laughs> it is very funny. My parents do say, "I never thought you'd be going into this uh, full time, Amber," but mm. okay. Um, but you know, it, it isn't just a toilet. It is this whole movement. Movements, though, are an entirely different matter. The Pequel is only set up for tinkles. The girls are now looking for investment abroad and hope their invention will keep them engaged for years to come. Jeff Moody, Talking Toilets for GB News. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that slightly graphic package there. We were just deciding who was going to pick up after... <laughs> His package. I said, look, I think it's this is your <laughs> ring. I'll, this is my, I'm going to sit back my, and you can deal with it. Uh, well, you know, this isn't the only way that women can pee easily in public. And actually, we're here with uh, Sam Fountain, who's the founder of Shiwi. What do you make of all this, uh, Sam? Oh, they're brilliant. I hadn't seen them before. Actually, I've used similar squat toilets in France, but fantastic. If it makes it quicker for ladies and more efficient, and actually we can become more practiced because the younger kids start using them, then genius. Yes, I love it. I love a female who's uh, designed something awesome for people to win without a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. They were actually at the London Marathon last year, which I was uh, running, and they were very useful indeed. Can you tell us a bit more about, about your invention, though? Because they've, they've been at festivals for, for really a long time now. How, how exactly does it work? Yes, so the Shiwi, we designed it in 1999, so, yeah, over 20 years. It works by acting as if a female has got the same appendage as a male. So you just unzip your fly put it between your legs and it directs the flow of wee away from your body. So you can either stand up at a female urinal or a male urinal if the cues are too long or behind a tree. So you don't need to expose your bottom. It's much safer. We find that women in the army use it because it's not just quicker, but it's safer not having to take your trousers down and have them around your ankles. Um, women in hospitals or people rehabbing, they use it as well. It's better than having a bedpan. So it's got loads of use. Um, we find the biggest market is walkers, generally people who want to be free. And it's so small, it just fits in your pocket. Yeah, it's really easy. You can just give it a flick and it's dry. <laughs> and Sam, how, how is business going? When did you found the company and how have you grown since then? Is it becoming more and more popular? More and more popular. So designed it in 1999, won the James Dyson Award that year when I was a student at university. Now, 22 years later, I actually sold the company to Dalesware, who are now called Chiwi which are a bit like Blacks and Menets and that, those sort of companies. And it continues to grow. So it's probably 10 to 20,000 units a month in the summer. Because oh, wow. the summer is actually the best of all time and the walkers. But we have distributors in the US and in Canada, all over the world, really. Um, Sam, you don't rent them, do you? There's quite... Oh, sorry? People don't rent them, do they? Or do they, they buy, they they buy them? buy them. They just buy them, so yeah, they're yeah, yeah. them. <laughs> and once you've got your own, you've got your own. But I have to say, they're a bit like umbrellas, that once you've got one, you probably lose it after a few months, and then you get another one, you get another colour. And some people are into the fad and they have different colours for different outfits. <laughs> well, that sounds brilliant. As someone who spends a lot of time in loo queues, I think I might be investing in one of those. Thank you so much, Sam. It's really great to hear from you. OK, more to come, including all the uh, latest updates from Sydney. There has been seven confirmed dead now from Sydney. We're going to be uh, on that just after the break. Live reports uh, and also, uh, yeah, we're going to recover that statement from the Australian PM, Anthony Albanese. This is uh, Saturday Morning Live. I forgot where we were then. On GB News with Ben and Olivia. Stay with us. <laughs> Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to the latest forecast from the Met Office. There'll be some fine weather in the south and the east today with even a few warm sunny spells elsewhere. It's going to be increasingly blustery and increasingly showery. Some low cloud at first across western parts and we've got this area of rain moving into northern and western England as well as Wales. And that'll tend to fizzle as we go into the afternoon and as it approaches the Midlands. Meanwhile, Scotland and Northern Ireland will be very unsettled with a gusty wind. Areas of rain followed by showers and sunny spells. Some of these showers will be lively. But ahead of all that, East Anglia and the southeast keep the sunny spells and highs of 19 or 20 Celsius. Into the evening and the showers and longer spells of rain tend to push eastwards and actually it turns mostly dry once again across England and Wales, eastern Scotland as well. Showers continuing for much of for the rest of Scotland as well as Northern Ireland along with a gusty wind. Where we've got lighter winds elsewhere it's going to be a chilly night, certainly a cold night compared with the last few nights with temperatures dipping below 5 Celsius in places.
But a bright start to the day on Sunday. We've got plenty of sunshine for England, Wales, southern and eastern Scotland. Showers from the word go across central and western Scotland, as well as parts of Northern Ireland. And then those showers develop more widely across the rest of Scotland into northern England, parts of Wales. Stays bright, though, towards the southeast. Here we'll have highs of 15 Celsius, feeling cooler but pleasant enough. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Uh, Saturday Morning Live here on GB News. We're going straight to Sydney again with this uh, shopping centre attack. At least five people are confirmed dead. The police now are suggesting that seven, including the attacker, have died. Just as a reminder, if you're just joining us, uh, so late last night, UK time, uh, a lone attacker entered a shopping centre in Bondi Beach in New South Wales, uh, went on a what can only be described as a stabbing spree, uh, including a nine-month-old baby who is currently undergoing surgery for critical injuries. So, uh, Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, uh, paid tribute to a heroic female police officer who apprehended the suspect, uh, actually shot him dead as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to continue to stay with this as we get more updates. So, at least five people dead. Australian police suggesting there may be seven. We're not quite clear on the final number just yet, but at least five dead in Australia as it stands. And we'll be, we'll be bringing you more about that awful story uh, throughout the rest of the show. But for now, here on Saturday Morning Live, we love to give a spotlight to people who do amazing things. And this week, we're joined by founder of choir organisation MD Brunch, Naveen Arles. Now, Naveen, it's fantastic to have you with us today. And I've just heard you give us a little talk about uh, what you do. And you sounded so enthusiastic. Um, I just want to, you to give, the, give the viewers a flavour of what you just told us. Well, I, what I, I guess when people ask me what I do and when my mum is waiting for me to grow up and get a job, <laughs> because I can't describe it so easily, I talk about myself as an animateur. But I guess what people understand that to be is a choir director or a musical director. Um, and people then think, well, but, and, you know, where's the, thank you, that's very nice, but what's the benefit there? And then, and that's a reasonable question, so I'd like to contextualise that a little bit. In the UK, we have more than 42,000 singing groups, and that stat's seven years old, so we know it grew massively after the pandemic. So 42,000 groups of people get together and sing. In those groups, there's 2.14 million people every week, and if you then stack that up, we have 300,000 people per week more singing a group than play amateur level football in the UK. So actually as a pastime, singing together in groups is the national pastime. Mm. Think about a football stadium, <laughs> think about the last wedding you were at, think about the last night out on, on, a, on a dance floor anywhere. And people are getting together and singing all the time because it makes you feel good. It does, lifts the soul, I think. Absolutely. So then actually though, then I, w what I started to realize was, you know, the Indian kid who should have grown up to be a doctor and didn't do that, so failed miserably. <laughs> Actually, when my colleagues and I doing the work that we do get in a room, we're, we're 30 people or 70 people or 300 people, and all of those people suddenly get to a place where they belong. 
they aren't ostracized somewhere else. They feel better. And so at a very simple, basic body level, your body gets healthier, your belonging gets better, so your well-being is better, and then the output that you take home to your lives gets better. I think it's a really fantastic thing to be doing, particularly in the sort of current climate. We know that, you know, churches, Church of England churches are closing, pubs are closing across the UK. Mm. All of those sort of mainstays of the community seem to be disappearing in front of our eyes. Do you see what you're doing as, as, a, as a kind of alternative to that, another way to have a, a local community? It's always been a way, since the beginning of human mm. nature, as a way to get together and sing. Families round a piano at Christmas time singing carols. Should have been the thing that we all still do, but we don't know how to play the piano anymore. But um, we, the, the people running those 42,000 choirs in the country, they aren't trained to do that often. There isn't like an actual formalized pathway. So the organization we set up empowers them to do their role better because they're doing all kinds of things. Like if they're not going down to the pub, we have to organize a building and then invite everybody and tell them where to so go. So, for example, you do uh, wellbeing support groups in prisons, is that right? Yes. So, so how, what does that entail practically? You go into prisons and you get all the prisoners to join in with a, a group singing session? If all of them would do it, that would be amazing. And what's, um, what's generally the response when you go in and you speak to the, the inmates? We're, we're super lucky in working with this organisation called Liberty Choir. Mm. We go in, we take volunteers with them and we socially interact because I guess rehabilitation looks like changing a behaviour pattern. So we normalise these people and, and they become us and they become free for two hours in a room where nothing between them and us is of any kind of boundary and we just sing together. The singing releases the dopamine mm. and the oxytocin and makes the body better. The sitting posture-wise better yeah. makes everybody... As soon as you said that, I just yeah. that quite yeah. naturally. But, so the health benefits, but them realising that they're valued by other people is hugely powerful. Mm. And the stories that come out of Liberty Choir of guys coming back out of prison not having that rehabilitation and then now finding new social networks and jobs outside is exciting. Well, look, you, you received the British Citizens Award, I think, for your efforts, your great work, and you are our greatest Briton this week. So congratulations to you, Naveen. You're doing great work, God's work, you would say, from singing and sharing the joy of music. So thank you so much and congratulations. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, more to come in the next hour, including all the latest from Sydney. We're going to keep you up to date with the death toll there. It's currently seven. That has been confirmed. Unfortunately, these are live pictures from that shopping centre, the Westfield Centre in Sydney. Uh, police have said that one of their officers, a female officer, who has actually been praised by the Australian Prime Minister this morning, saying that she was courageous in apprehending that suspect alone by herself, and she saved many many lives in the process. You're with Ben and Olivia on Saturday Morning Live, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Stay with us, we'll be back in a tick. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello and a very good morning to you. I'm Ben Leo alongside Olivia Utley and this is Saturday Morning Live. Great to have your company this morning and we've got an action-packed show coming up. Well, our, our top story this morning is the awful news breaking from Sydney. A major incident has been declared after reports that multiple people, we're hearing now, uh, six people have been stabbed, killed uh, in a shopping centre. That was late last night, UK time. It is the holidays in Australia. There are lots of families out in that shopping centre in Westfield. And horrifically, one of the victims is a nine-month-old baby. That child is in hospital at the moment, receiving urgent surgery, and we will keep you updated with what is going on with that child. Yeah, really tragic news and horrible scenes. The video is circulating online from bystanders who have recorded incidents on their phone. Uh, we see a man running through the shopping centre with a quite a large knife in his hand. And also, heroically, as the Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, uh, we saw footage which is circulating online. We'll see if we can get it for you of a female police officer apprehending the knifeman by herself in what the Aussie PM has described as courageous, heroic. And I think Olivia said that she had saved many, many lives in the process. So. Absolutely. I mean, eyewitness accounts said that uh, if, if that police officer had not intervened, then this man would have carried on. He was on a rampage, it said. So thank goodness that that very brave police officer intervened. We're going to be reacting to that uh, and all our other stories today with commentator uh, Candice Holdsworth and singer and TV personality Ben Ofeidu. Plenty more to come, inclu including the countdown is on, arguably, for the world's most famous horse race. I call it the greatest show on turf. It's the Grand National. It's, of course, kicking off today. We're going to be going live to Aintree, uh, Aintree rather, in Liverpool with Sophie Reaper for a Grand National Bonanza. Will you be betting on any races today? Let us know. And how do you feel about having a Royal Navy with recruits that can't necessarily swim? Is this a sink or swim moment for the British Armed Forces? We'll be discussing this with a former British Marine and we'll find out more. So that swimming story from the Navy is ridiculous, isn't it? So they've changed the rules to allow non-swimmers to join and start training, right? But yeah, they've, they've changed the rules. So non-swimmers can join. They have to pass the swimming test before they're actually allowed to join, but they will be given lessons with the Navy. Dear, oh dear. Mm. What do you guys make of that? GBnews.com forward slash your say. Some people, critics, have said that it shows rank desperation of the armed forces because they just can't recruit anyone. They can't recruit anyone, and this is the issue. So they're having to, to open up that field wider and wider. Wider. But I think the idea for, for lots of people of someone on a boat defending our nation who would have big problems if they got in the water is quite worrying. OK, well, look, there's lots of hard news going around today, so we need to lighten up a bit. We're going to be joined a bit later on by a wine expert to discuss the impacts of post-Brexit wine tax. And I think we might even have a little tip or two if we're lucky, Olivia. But before all that, uh, here's your news headlines with Sam Francis.
Ben and Olivia, thank you very much. And good morning from the newsroom. It's uh, just coming up to four minutes past 11. And we start with a recap of that breaking news coming out of Sydney this morning. As we've been hearing, a major police operation is ongoing after a stabbing spree at a shopping centre near Bondi Beach. We now know that at least six people have been killed in that attack, which took place at the busy Westfield Centre. Uh, we also understand that a solo female police officer was in the area at the time of the attack, tracked down the suspect. He was appearing to have been wearing a green rugby league shirt and was seen running around the complex. He then allegedly raised his knife before he was shot and killed by that officer. Police haven't at this stage identified the suspect, but believe he did act alone. So far, there's no motive, but terrorism hasn't been ruled out. If you're watching on television, you can see here live pictures from the scene outside the shopping centre in Sydney. Uh, and uh, the officers earlier were also seen in aerial footage searching the shopping centre's rooftop car park. New South Wales police have now confirmed a nine-month-old baby is among eight victims who were stabbed during the attack. They have all now been taken to a number of hospitals across the city. While Australia's Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has thanked the country's brave police and first responders. Today, Bondi Junction was the scene of shocking violence, but it was also witness to the humanity and the heroism of our fellow Australians. Our brave police, our first responders, and of course everyday people who could never have imagined that they would face such a moment. And some of the footage is quite extraordinary. Well, soon after the uh, incident in Sydney, we also heard from the Assistant Commissioner, Anthony Cook, who gave this update. Our hearts go out uh, to all of them, uh, as they do to anyone touched by this terrible incident this afternoon. I do not have information in relation to the offender. I do not know at this stage who he is. You would be uh, you would understand this is quite raw. Uh, inquiries are very new and we are continuing to make attempts to identify the offender in this matter. Police uh, and paramedics received multiple calls at around three o'clock in the afternoon from members of the public in the shopping centre reporting seeing a man stabbing people indiscriminately. Here's how some of those witnesses described the moments. I, I didn't see him properly, I was running, but um, it's just, it was insane, it was insanity, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, some guy running around stabbing people, seems pretty random, probably a terrorist attack. We saw all these people running towards us and then we heard a shot. The uh, accounts there of witnesses uh, in Sydney during that knife attack in the shopping centre. As I said, the major police operation is still unfolding. We will, of course, keep across that for you throughout the day. Do stay with Ben and Olivia over the next hour for more on that. In other news, a ship appears to have been boarded by what's been described as an unknown party off the coast of the United Arab Emirates. A warning's been issued by the UK's Maritime Authority, but at this stage it is light on detail. It comes after Iran has called Israel's pres presence in the UAE a threat and had warned it would close the shipping lane if it was provoked. Meanwhile, as Middle East tensions continue to rise, the US president says that he fears an Iranian attack on America's allies will come sooner rather than later. However, Joe Biden had this warning for Tehran. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. Thank you very much. That warning from... That warning there from Joe Biden uh, comes as the Iranian government promised to have revenge for an Israeli airstrike on its consulate in Damascus that killed some of its top commanders. In response, the US is now moving additional assets to the Middle East and countries including India, France and Poland have also warned their citizens against travelling to the region. Back here in the UK, the Chancellor says that he is ready to cut taxes and to bet on growth after the economy grew by 0.1% in February. The Office for National Statistics also revised January's figure, pushing it up to 0.3%. Writing in the Daily Express, Jeremy Hunt says Britain has done the hard yards and the economy is bouncing back. But Labour says most people aren't feeling any of the benefits with low growth and higher taxes under the Conservative government. 
Liz Truss has revealed that Larry the Downing Street cat was her saviour during her time as Prime Minister. She's written a book about her 49 days in charge, which is being previewed by the Mail. The former Prime Minister also says she was in shock when the late Queen Elizabeth died on her second full day in the job. And horse racing's biggest race of the year, the Grand National, is taking place this afternoon, but there are a few changes. New safety measures are in place, meaning six fewer horses are running later. It's after four horses died last year. However, the RSPCA still wants the British Horse Racing Authority to investigate after two more horses died just yesterday. On the track, though, it will be as competitive as ever for the million-pound prize. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Ben and Olivia. Well, we do have some more news now on that baby who was attacked in this awful stabbing in Sydney. Uh, the, uh, an eyewitness says the baby got stabbed, the mum got stabbed and came over with a baby and threw it at me. I was holding the baby. It looked pretty bad. But he later goes on to say that with the compression, he managed to stop some of the bleeding. He's really hoping that that baby is OK. Well, now we're joined by GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White. Mark, can you tell us a little, bo little more about what's happening right now? Yes, that man you were referring to was interviewed on Nine News a little earlier. He spoke of how the mother looked very badly injured, uh, came up to him and handed the baby over to him. The baby had also been stabbed, he said. He managed to stem the flow until paramedics arrived, but clearly very concerned as well for the mother of this infant. Uh, one of eight people who are now being treated in hospital uh, for varying degrees of injuries from critical to serious and we're told confirmation now from New South Wales Police that six people who were stabbed have died. One of the eight who was taken to hospital has succumbed to their injuries as well. No further details uh, on that individual but absolutely horrific scenes that unfolded in the shopping centre, the Westfield Shopping Centre at Bondi Junction just after about 3.20 in the afternoon, according to the police. They said that they were alerted to reports of a man stabbing multiple people. A lone police officer, a police inspector, rushed to the scene. Uh, she tried to catch up with this individual. She eventually did on the fifth level of the shopping centre. According to reports, this man turned round, knife in hand, raised, and the officer opened fire. That undoubtedly, according to authorities, saved more lives. Well, we've been hearing from the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, in the last hour. He praised this officer and he spoke about the horrific nature of this attack. Today, Bondi Junction was a scene of shocking violence, but it was also witness to the humanity and the heroism of our fellow Australians. Our brave police, our first responders, and of course everyday people who could never have imagined that they would face such a moment. And some of the footage is quite extraordinary. And, of course, that brave police officer is quite rightly being commended for her actions, but also members of the public intervened as well. We saw images of one man at the top of an escalator. He'd managed, I think, to press the emergency stop to stop that escalator. The attacker trying to get up the stairs, and this man had one of these bollards that you use with a bit of tape across to, to shut off the escalator. He picked that up, uh, and he was managing to fend off the attack are incredibly brave uh, intervention by this member of the public because this shopping centre was full of families at this time, a busy Saturday afternoon. This attacker seen on that video, on that CCTV, running around uh, and randomly stabbing people and people trying to run and get out of his way. OK, Mark White, thank you very much for that update. Just, you know, just a horrific detail. And actually, we don't know the motive yet of this attack. However, I can't help but be reminded of 
the London Bridge terror attack in 2017. I happened to be there. I was getting a sandwich. I was on a night shift at uh, my old newspaper, The Sun. Uh, the Westminster Bridge attack, you know, and uh, eyewitnesses have spoken to ABC News in America, they, um, Australia. They've said that there are people running, hundreds and hundreds of people running, some who weren't fit enough, old ladies, elderly gentlemen, um, and they were terrified running for their lives. Have we ha uh, had any update on the uh, exact number of dead yet? Is it seven confirmed with the attacker? Is that right? Yes, yeah, six innocent people uh, and the attacker himself. So seven is the number of fatalities at this hour. But of concern is the news from the police that, of course, uh, some of those in hospital are in critical condition. And we know that one of those people succumbed to their injuries. Mm. Also, of course, getting uh, these reports as well uh, that the attacker, as far as they're concerned, they haven't been able to establish yet what any motivation was. They haven't found anything at the scene that points to a motivation, but importantly, they haven't ruled anything out. They haven't ruled terrorism out as a motivation at this stage, although Anthony Albanese, yeah. the Australian Prime Minister, wasn't willing to be drawn on that uh, uh, on at this stage. But clearly, uh, a lot of people concerned, as you say, quite rightly, Ben, it has echoes of what we've seen on not just in London, but in so many places and cities uh, mm. around the world with these lone individuals going on a rampage, just grabbing a knife and inflicting terrible, terrible harm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, Mark, and we will be speaking to you again uh, a bit later in the show. Um, we're joined now by a journalist, drive host for 2GB, uh, Chris O'Keefe, who is in Sydney at the moment. Uh, Chris, are you there? Can you tell us more about what's been going on? I can, and uh, unfortunately I can confirm the mother of that nine-month-old baby that was stabbed has unfortunately succumbed to her injuries. Oh, so it's quite 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 a terrible thing and if i can paint a picture and i know you ben just said that this was very similar to what you recollect from the 2017 mm. london the borough markets incident yeah it is extremely similar you've got to remember this is the first day of school holidays here in sydney there were kids everywhere there were families everywhere bondi junction is like the mayfield of sydney it is an affluent area. It is an extremely busy shopping centre. You can never get a car park. There's always people in there. And at 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, it would have been absolutely full to the brim. And this gentleman, whoever he was, whatever his motivation was, police don't know who he is. They haven't certainly uh, shared that with the public by any stretch of the imagination. But there was no... Uh, discussion about any ideological uh, comments made during the stabbing attacks or anything of the like. So we're kind of in the dark, but if I can paint a picture of exactly what that was, you, you're talking about families, you're talking about babies, you're talking about young kids on their first day of their April school holidays confronted with a guy with a 6 to 12 inch knife running around indiscriminately stabbing people. Now, thankfully, the situation is in hand, as police say. There is no active threat at Bondi Junction. It is an extremely affluent area. There are, it, it is well known in the eastern suburbs of Sydney to be uh, dense in terms of its Jewish population. Now, there is no suggestion at all that this has anything to do with what's going on in the Middle East. Mm. There has been some some people sort of trying to infer that, but I think that would be both unhelpful and extremely premature, given authorities uh, haven't uh, told us anything about that just yet. So uh, as it stands right now, six innocent people have lost their lives. The stabber, the, the attacker himself, he has been shot by an incredibly brave policewoman who was there on her own with no help, with no partner, with no team members, and did the noble and right thing to save many, many other people's lives. So we can only be thankful for her. What a hero. Uh, your Prime Minister alluded to it earlier, courageous, fearless, running towards danger, and in no doubt saved many, many lives. And Chris, just to confirm, you say that the mother of that nine-month-old baby, as you understand, 
the baby's uh, in hospital uh, having surgery on critical injuries, but the mother, you think, has died? Yeah, she has. I can confirm that. She has passed away. And I was uh, watching some of my colleagues at, at on Nine News here in Australia uh, talking with two gentlemen where the mother effectively was stabbed in the back multiple times. Her infant was also stabbed, nine-month-old child. She then threw the baby to two unsuspecting passers-by and said, please look after my baby as she's trying to get some sort of treatment from people in a Chanel shop in the middle of a department store in a suburb of Sydney, and she was not in a good way at that point. But I'm told from what those witnesses said happened was her final uh, efforts to ensure that her baby injuries weren't and the blood loss wasn't as significant as it couldn't be as it could have been the mother's final efforts uh potentially saved that baby's life so fingers crossed and we're hoping and praying that that All baby's right. life is saved but for, for the mother it is just and that family my god how, how could you how could you possibly how could you possibly put yourself in their shoes spine tingling detail chris and uh you know just just awful all I can say is I'm sorry this has happened to you and your people and your country, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, no, you're welcome, me. and our heart went out to you guys. Yeah, got the end of that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I'm, uh, I'm welling up with emotion there. So, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, describing how the mother of that nine-month-old baby who is in hospital receiving surgery, her last act as a mother was handing her baby to someone, saving... Uh, saving their life, and the mother has died uh, as a result, Candice. It's evil. I mean, what sort of person stabs a mother with her baby? I mean, we don't know what the motivations for it were, but, I mean, what sort of mindset does that? I cannot imagine how desperate she must have been in those last few moments. I mean, it's just... It's horrible. It's, it's unbelievable. I've never really been close to crying on, you know, on TV, and I'm trying to compose myself. It's... I just... Oh, I'm lost for words. Lost for words. I just... Terrible. Yeah, just don't... Terrible. It did. Uh, as I said to Chris, I was I happened to be working in 2017 at the Sun newspaper when the London Bridge terror attack was taking place. I went down to get a sandwich and I somehow found myself uh, amongst it all. And just seeing this brings chills down my spine, imagining yeah. the terror that these people are going through. We heard eyewitness accounts speaking to ABC News Australia from, I think it was a woman who was working in a nearby salon. She said, we had uh, elder women, elderly women coming into the salon who were in Westfield. They were traumatised. We had to sit them down because they were running. They weren't fit enough to run fast enough. Uh, fast enough. Other people, they'd seen things that had happened in Tommy Hill figure where they were seeing stabs. It was absolutely horrific. Um, Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, of course, uh, describing earlier, and if there is one slither of positivity from this awful news, it's the heroics and the courageous actions, yeah. Olivia, of that female police officer. Absolutely just incredible. Uh, she was on her own going in and shooting dead that attacker. And it's said by eyewitnesses on the ground that if she hadn't stepped in at the moment that she did, then this tragedy could have been even worse than it was. So it's just incredible to think about what, what she did there. Those people are incredible. I mean, you mentioned the London Bridge attacks. I mean, I remember a police officer just trying to fend off people with a baton, and that's all he had. Mm. I mean, this is just... I mean, it's an animal response. I mean, you just have an animal response in, in those moments. The trauma, though, is long-lasting. I mean, there are so many families now who's, who have lost someone. They just stepped out to have the most ordinary day imaginable, and uh, this is the sort of news they're going to be getting. It's just horrific. And I think that's the thing as well. I mean, there's, there's the, the, the people who've actually been attacked and their families, their friends, everyone in their social circle, but also we hear reports that hundreds of people were, were having to, to flee the scene, and those people will yeah. have those memories for the rest of that. their lives. I yes. just really... I, I thank God for bravery. Mm. You know, I, I remember with the, uh, the Borough Market attacks and there was, like, a football... Uh, supporter saying this is Millwall, you know, yeah. standing at standing at a bar, and you know, in any other occasion, you say, "Oh, he's a football hooligan," but the, whatever, you know, that's what people would have said. Yeah. But people like that end up saving lives. Yeah. You know, this fight or flight thing is a really real thing, and I, I know it's not for all of us to stand and fight, but I just. Thank God that they were just brave people who would run towards it and they don't think about it. It's, and like you said, it's, the, it's quite animalistic. You don't think about it. You see it and you just jump in and you, you end up saving many. So I well, just... I've, I've sat many a time in incidents like this saying, yeah, of course, you've got to get involved and you've got to help. You know, of course you have. But when you're 
in the moment, as I was in London Bridge, when you're in the moment, I ran. I was yeah. terrified. You yeah, know, you, you, you everyone likes to play the big man, but it takes very courageous people you know, to, to, kind people of, to get involved. A lone female police officer. Uh, wow. Crazy. So just uh, as an update, um, unfortunately, we just heard from Chris O'Keefe from 2GB Radio in Sydney that the nine-month-old baby who was stabbed and is currently receiving uh, surgery in hospital, the mother, her last heroic act as a mother was to give her baby to somebody else, uh, get it to safety and stop uh, its, its injuries, stop its bleeding. We're going to stick with this Sydney story for uh, the next hour or so. We'll be back after the break. Stay with us, Ben and Olivia, on Saturday Morning Live, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very staid and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of making your mind up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... ABBA was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after ABBA's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It, was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing. But the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 11.27, you're with Ben and Olivia on Saturday Morning Live on GB News. We're going to go back to Sydney very shortly with an update on what's going on there, the tragic scenes from that shopping centre. But first, uh, a slight change of gear. Today, of course, is the Grand National. Uh, it's well underway, the festival, and the big race is at around, I think, 4 o'clock this afternoon. So thousands of people are descending upon Aintree in Liverpool for the annual horse race, including our very own Sophie Reaper, GB News Northwest of England reporter. Sophie, looking fab, may I say, in blue. What are you drinking there? I've got a little bit of champagne this morning. It might be early, but it's a special day here in Aintree today. Of course, as you say, the Grand National running at 4pm. So to talk a little bit about this and the importance of it to the city of Liverpool, I'm joined by iconic Liverpudlian and uh, G friend of GB News, Pete Price. Good morning to you, Pete. Definitely a friend of GB News because I do the breakfast show. I love reviewing the papers. We are here at the art school, Paul Askew's, 
in the middle of Aintree and it's Grand National Day. This is the most amazing thing ever. And I've been at the Grand National when you and the cameraman weren't born. And this is how many years ago it was. A bottle of Moe Chandon was 12 and 6 in old money, which is about 75 pence for a bottle of champagne. That's how many years I've been coming to the National. I imagine this perhaps costs slightly more than that. There's a Jerry Bowen over there waiting for us to yes, finish it. indeed. <laughs> So you are, of course, an iconic Scouser. This, uh, this festival, the Grand National, it must mean so much to you. Tell me about how it makes you feel coming to this every year. It's incredible. Thursday is a, a sort of like a race day. It's a really strange, nice day, more real race cars. Friday is Ladies' Day, which is outrageous. And yesterday was unbelievable. And it's incredible. Amazing. And we give them all uh, flip-flops to go home with, which is great. And then today, the world is watching. The world is watching Liverpool right now. And it's one of the biggest races, if not the biggest race in the world. The People have come from all over. Uh, I've been interviewing people today, and I think Blackpool is empty because they're all here. It's incredibly iconic. And, you know, we had that dreadful pandemic. Was it ever going to come back again? It's come back bigger and better than it's ever been. So if anyone's watching at home, what, what should they expect to see on camera today from Aintree? What are the people of Liverpool going to bring out? They just bring out an atmosphere of love and joy. You couldn't come here on your own. You would not be left. I mean, this restaurant here is absolutely buzzing. And this is one of many of the restaurants. And there's restaurants that cater to everybody. This is fine dining and this is superb. Just behind us here where the horse is, that over there is where the, the horse is... Um, parade and then go through over to there. But what is great, Sir Kenny Delgleish is here, um, Sam Quack's here. People are just dotted all over the place and you just bump into people and everybody's got time for you. And it's great fun. And please, the rain is going to stay yes. off. Don't Felt rain. a couple of drops, haven't couple we? But it is holding off for us just now. Of course, it's still a few hours to the Grand National, but several of the races as well for people to enjoy. I believe so. <laughs> I come to the National and never see a horse. Honestly, I just love this. You don't I gamble come... either, do you? No, I come to party. I just love partying. I actually worked here uh, for a few years. I used to work all the marquees and do a comedy spot. So I'd do 10 minutes on a comedy spot and then I would um, in, 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 introduce the, the tipster and then we would go and it was great fun. And I used to walk from here with a lot of money in my pocket and not waste it at all. Amazing. Pete, thank you so much for your time. Let's have a quick cheers, cheers. to the, a good Grand National and the rain holding off for us. Have a good time and watch the race. Well, thank you so much for that, Sophie. It looks like it's shaping up to be a really great day there in Aintree. You're looking wonderful good. in your blue. She's got the best job today, hasn't she? She the has best got the best job today, hasn't she? S swigging on wine <laughs> at half eleven in the morning. Goodness me. Well, that's going to be us racing. We're going to be back with her later on all throughout the day, of course, so uh, we'll see what kind of state she's in. Hopefully she moderates herself. Hey, Sophie. <laughs> Right, coming up next, Sam Francis has your news headlines. Uh, very good morning to you. It's just after half past 11. And uh, we return now to news out of Sydney, where a major police operation is ongoing after a stabbing spree at a shopping centre near Bondi Beach. We now know the death toll has risen to seven. That includes the lone knife attacker. Footage from the shopping centre appears to have shown the suspect in shorts and a green rugby league shirt running around that complex. He was then tracked down by a lone female police officer who was in the area at the time. He allegedly raised his knife before he was shot and killed by that officer. At this stage, police haven't identified the suspect but believe he acted alone. Today, Bondi Junction was the scene of shocking violence but it was also witness to the humanity and the heroism of our fellow Australians. Our brave police, our first responders, and of course everyday people who could never have imagined that they would face such a moment. And some of the footage is quite extraordinary. Anthony Albanese there speaking uh, earlier after the incident in Sydney. Police, as I say, have now confirmed that a nine-month-old baby is among eight victims who were stabbed during that attack. They have been taken to a number of hospitals across the city. And as we heard there from Anthony Albanese, he was thanking the country's brave police and first responders.
our hearts go out uh, to all of them uh, as they do to anyone touched by this terrible incident this afternoon. I do not have information in relation to the offender. I do not know at this stage who he is. You would be, uh, you would understand this is quite raw. Uh, inquiries are very new and we are continuing to make attempts to identify the offender in this matter. Uh, police Commissioner from Sydney there, Anthony Cook, giving an update earlier. Well, multiple police and paramedics were called to reports of that lone knifeman stabbing people indiscriminately. That was just after three o'clock in the afternoon, local time. And uh, we're going to cross now live to Sydney, where the police are giving another update on the incident. We uh, provide an update uh, for you all uh, following the, uh, the media conference that was done at 6.30 tonight by Assistant Commissioner Tony Cook. And I'll start from the top, just so I don't miss anything, um, just to clarify those details. About 3.30 this afternoon, a male with a knife entered the Westfield Shopping Centre at Bondi Junction and attacked a number of people. Police were called and a police officer responded and faced that man and neutralised the threat within that shopping centre. Other police attended and helped witnesses, shopkeepers and others that were in the shopping centre move on from the shopping centre. As a result, there were four female women deceased in the shopping centre and one male and subsequently another female passed away in hospital, taking it to a total of six plus the death of the offender. There are uh, about eight people in hospitals around Sydney being treated for different injuries associated with being attacked in the hospital, uh, in, sorry, at the shopping centre, including a nine-month-old infant that is being, has been in surgery. Police have secured the crime scene which you can imagine is expansive inside a very big, busy commercial shopping centre in Sydney. And the crime scene remains ongoing and it will remain ongoing for a number of days. The shopping centre it will in fact be closed tomorrow for trade and Westfields will work with police to assist in the removal of vehicles etc from the shopping centre tomorrow. But in the meantime, the shopping centre will remain a crime scene. Later this evening, we come, became aware of who we believe the, the offender is. And we believe that he is a 40-year-old man. However, we are waiting to formally identify him and we cannot speculate yet on his identification. But let me assure you that we are confident that there is no ongoing risk and we are dealing with one person who is now deceased. Um, are there any questions? What do you know about this 40-year-old man at this stage? Um, well, I actually will hand over to the Deputy Commissioner who's acting for investigations about... Uh, we, we know a little bit about this person, but as I said, we're waiting co to confirm his identification. Um, and if, in fact, it is the person that we believe it is, then we don't have fees for that person holding an ideation. In other words, that it's not a terrorism incident. Is that, is that person a man who is known to you? Um, he's known to law enforcement, um, but yep, he's, we're waiting to identify him formally. Thank you. Is that if it is this man, this is not a, a terrorist we'll, As I said, the investigation will be ongoing for many, many days, but there are elements that we understand at this point in time that, that don't indicate that. But as we move into the investigation and background, background, background this, off, this um, person, his home, his vehicle, his associates, we will only know at that time. Do you know his state of mind during the attack? 
No. Intoxicated? We don't know. If it isn't, if um, it's, it's unlikely to be terrorism once the, it's for, this person formally identified, is there any, any other early indications of what might have motivated them to do something like this? Not yet. And it's really, it will take a thorough investigation. It will take time for us to go back in his life and history to determine that. And was, he, was he randomly, was it a, is, is the indication that it was a random OK, that was Police Commissioner Karen Webb in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we're going to Mark White, our Home and Security Editor now, for an update. Well, some significant information there from the Police Commissioner confirming that although they've not made a formal identification, they know who the killer uh, who was taken down by a police officer was a 40-year-old man known, she said, to the police. However, uh, the sort of preliminary investigations into his background would not appear to show any link to terrorism, but that, she said, could, of course, change as they delve further into the background of this individual. But that attacker, of course, taken down by that lone police inspector who was patrolling nearby and arrived in the shopping centre and managed to catch up with him on the fifth floor of the shopping centre and open fire before the man could stab any other individuals. Also, of course, the confirmation coming from the commissioner that there are six people, innocent people, who were killed. Uh, and of course, the gunman, uh, the gunman, the uh, knife attacker uh, shot dead as well. So the six uh, people who died, according to uh, the police commissioner, included four women and a man in the shopping centre and then another female who died in hospital. In addition to that, eight other people are being treated in a number of hospitals for various degrees uh, of injuries from critical to serious. So the ongoing investigation at this time will involve multiple crime scenes and mean, of course, that that shopping centre will remain closed for a while. Well, thank you very much for that update, Mark, and we'll have more from you uh, as the day progresses. Now, though, to the break. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges. Proposals tabled by the local Green Party are passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalize the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. 
only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. with Ben and Olivia on Saturday Morning Live on GB News. Just a quick update about the situation in Sydney, Australia, the Knifeman running riot in a shopping centre there. Seven confirmed dead, including the attacker. Uh, tributes made to a really heroic female police officer who apprehended the attacker all by herself, saving many, many lives. Uh, and uh, a really tragic anecdote as well. A nine-month-old baby currently receiving surgery in hospital for stab wounds. The mother... Uh, unfortunately, we heard some extraordinary detail how she handed the baby over to a, a stranger, saved his life or her life, the young baby, unfortunately, tragically died herself from her injuries. So a really, really horrific details coming out from Australia. Right, it's time now for your weekly dose of showbiz news. We're delighted to have showbiz journalist Ellie Phillips with us. Hello, Ellie. Hi. How are you doing? Yeah, it's time to lighten the mood a little bit on this yes, tragic let's day. let's try. What have you got in store? Bridget Jones 4. Bridget Jones for the film is coming. It's been announced. Um, it's official. It's happening. It's going to film this summer in London and then it's slated for a 2025 Valentine's Day release. So it feels really far away, but I think it's going to be really exciting to see it filmed in London. Um, it's set four years after the last instalment, which was in 2016 it was filmed, um, which was Bridget Jones's baby. Um, and... She's obviously going to return, Renny Zellweger, as is Hugh Grant. And the new addition to the cast is Leo Woodall. So he's the big star of One Day. He's been in White Lotus. Everyone loves him. And apparently he is going to play Bridget Jones's lover, 30-year-old lover, um, which sadly means that Colin Firth won't return because Mark Darcy in this final instalment will have died. Oh, I know, tragic, tragic it? but it's about life after that and you know, moving on from that. So really exciting news, Bridget Jones fans, it's happening. There was some talk that um, the Gen Z or the Gen Zers, however you pronounce it, we're going to kick off about the facts that, you know, about fat shaming, yeah. of course. What's all that about? Yeah, people say, you know, it's outdated now. If you look at the original films about how, you know, she said she was overweight. When you look at her weight on the, the markers, you're like, that's a normal weight. Like, what's going like on? 11 stone or something. Yeah, but, <laughs> nine and a half. but I think you have to take it as it is. It was what it was. Times have yeah. changed and hopefully this bit of the film will reflect that change and I think I, I'm pretty certain it will. It's quite refreshing to see a, a sort of middle-aged woman with a, with a much younger uh, male love. I am yes. all about this. Yeah. I'm yeah. loving this life for her. She's like, yeah, I've lost my husband. I've got two young kids to bring up and I'm going to keep living my best life and move on. And if that means with a hot 30-year-old in Leo Woodall, <laughs> then why not? How signs have changed. What a sad, sad movie. casting that is. <laughs> exactly. What else have you got? So, um, sadly, Opening Night, which is the play that Sheridan Smith has been in, um, which received very mixed reviews on the West End, is going to close two months early, which is kind of unheard of oh. in the West End. It's mixed reviews, a polite way of saying it. Mixed reviews terrible. is a very polite way of saying it. It's based on the 1997 film by John um because of it is if I can say his name right, because of it is. Sounds great, though. Um, and it oh. follows, yeah, it follows um, a theatre production company in New York trying to make it on Broadway. She plays the star role in it, a woman with mental health problems. And I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of the press was focused around the fact that some of the play takes place outside the theatre. She has a breakdown in the street, a drunken meltdown, uh, and that is streamed live back into the theatre. A lot of theatre goers didn't get it. There were reports of people leaving early, but the producers have said the official line is that it's challenging financial times for the theatre world, which well, is true. True enough. Yeah, so they cut it short. Unfortunately, it will finish in May. It was meant to finish in July. So if you want to go and see it, go and see it now. I will say, of all the reviews, she's been given flying colours, which is Absolutely. only to be expected. Absolutely. She's unbelievable. Mm. Like, she is... Have you seen it? I've not seen this, but I've seen her in other things before live, and, like, my jaw is on the floor every time she performs in anything. And she can sing as well. Like, funny girl. Yeah, so I would say go see it. Just, you know, interesting watch. I'm kind of... It's made me more intrigued now, yeah, makes you know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Great stuff. Thank you, Ellie. We'll yes, have you back so next welcome. week, hopefully for a longer stint. Sorry, it's been short yeah, this week, but stop. excellent as always. Still to come, uh, and it's quite apt this, actually, isn't it, Olivia? We're going to be joined by a wine expert in the studio, and after all the really tragic and horrible stories we've had today from Sydney, uh, I think a little tipple is well in order. So stay with us. You're with Ben and Olivia on Saturday Morning Live, and the wine is coming next.
Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. It's a bit of a drier start to the weekend for some of us and a warm start too. However, low pressure still remains close by up to the north of the UK, but high pressure down towards the south and the west is bringing something a little more settled this weekend for southern areas. So in the south, there will be plenty of sunshine today. A cold frontal system does slowly push its way south and eastward, so a bit more rain and drizzle across parts of Wales and northern parts of England. But it's across Scotland and Northern Ireland that will see the worst of the weather today. Plenty of showers around here and some of those showers perhaps turning quite heavy and wintry across the high ground. Further south in that sunshine though, another warm day, highs of 20, 21, maybe even 22 degrees. Through Saturday evening, that cold front continues to clear its way eastward, so generally turning much drier for most of us overnight into the start of Sunday. Some showers still continuing across parts of Scotland, these perhaps heavy in places, but under those clear skies, those temperatures will be dropping off a little. Down into the single figures, maybe seven or eight further south, but even at as low as three or four, and perhaps even some frost across parts of Scotland. So a bit of a chilly start here and a dry and bright start for a time before those showers continue to push in from the west as as we go through Sunday daytime. Further south, a dry start as well, plenty of sunshine through the morning. There will be some cloud bubbling up here and that heavy rain continues across parts of Scotland. A little bit of a cooler day though with highs in the south of only 13 or 14 degrees. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Tom Harwood. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, welcome back to GB News Saturday Morning Live with me, Olivia Utley and Ben Leo. And some bad news, I'm afraid, now if you're a red wine lover, because consumers have been told that prices on some of the best-loved red wines could increase by up to 40% next year. It comes after the government supposedly ignored pleas from the wine industry to abandon complex post-Brexit tax changes and are said to cost businesses huge sums of money. To talk through uh, what all of this means, and also he's got some wine with us as well, which I'm very... Uh, uh, appreciative of. We're joined now by Managing Director and Head Winemaker at Lime Bay Winery, James Lambert. Good morning to you, James. Good morning. Explain what's going on with this post-Brexit wine tax then. How's it hampered your business? Uh, well, I think first and foremost, last year in August, we saw the biggest single increase in wine duty for the last 50 years. Mm. So we went from a very simple um, uh, method of taxation of wine £2.23 for all wines between 85 and 15% alcohol. That then has changed. It went from 2.23 to 2.67. So for the consumer, that's a 53p increase because uh, in our government's wisdom, we also charge VAT mm. on duty as well. So we tax a tax. So we've got a couple of bottles there. Mm. Lime Bay, what have we got? We've got Pinot Noir, the red. And what's, we've what's got the a crack open list. Ooh. A bit, bit of red. Red? A bit, bit of red. Let's have a taste. <laughs> so, uh, so only... <laughs> Sorry, Olivia, you go. Oh, I was just, so this is an English winery that, that, that you're running? Yes. Here. Yes. So, and, and, and it, even you are being, uh, are being hampered by these post-Brexit rules. You would have thought that post-Brexit we would be welcoming in the era of English wine. Well, quite right. I mean, I wear two hats, really. I'm a member of the UK uh, drinks industry, but also uh, an English wine producer. 
So I think first and foremost, the big change is happening in February next year, where we go from one level of tax for wines between 11 and a half and 14 and a half percent alcohol up to 30 different taxation levels. I thought we were supposed to be cutting red tape with it's Brexit. This absolute, sounds like winding the whole industry in red it's tape. It's absolute madness. You know, we've got such a great opportunity to help our industry and to support the, the businesses within our industry. Mm. And as a UK producer as well, we're such a success story. I mean, the growth of, of vineyards and wineries in the UK has been exponential. Um, and so, you know, from one hand, on the one hand, we want to ideally see at least just stop um, the, the changes, really, prevent this February change, for heaven's sake. Oh, absolutely. You know, if you think it through in terms of the administrative costs of, of, of checking all these alcohol and, levels... And English wine is supposed to be this, this great new frontier in the UK, right? Because is it true to say that, that in a few years' time, because of climate change, England will be a better place to grow champagne than champagne itself? Absolutely. I mean, uh, our sparkling wines are already um, a huge success story domestically and in, uh, in other countries around the world as well. I think we're, we're demonstrably... Um, uh, um, performing extremely well against champagne and, and other traditional methods of sparkling wines. But the other uh, key kind of success story that's quietly uh, becoming uh, more and more successful is our still wines. And we're finding pockets of land in and around the UK. Lime Bay itself, we source grapes from all over the UK. Um, and there are some regions that are really ripening uh, grapes like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. You're tasting the Pinot Noir now to alcohol levels, potential alcohol levels of 13% upwards, naturally, in the UK. So mm. We are now becoming uh, a serious still wine producer. Such a good news story. Mm. You would have thought that the government would be sort of embracing it with open arms, but absolutely. apparently not. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I personally, um, and for our industry, would love to see excise duty scrapped for all UK uh, produced wines. I think the yeah. cost of producing wine in the UK is, also, is already extremely high. We're already on the back foot relative to other wine producing regions from around the world. If we were to scrap excise duty uh, and say, for example, it were to increase uh, sales of English wines by 40%, that would be £72 million extra revenue. Uh, that would be £14 million uh, extra to the Exchequer and VAT. Uh, and that's before you're looking at all the extra employment yeah. opportunities and investment opportunities. Can I ask you about... I remember years mm. ago when I worked at a local newspaper 10, 12 years ago, Night Timber, uh, mm. their vineyard is quite near to my house, and we had such an awful wet season, very similar. It's probably not as bad as we've had recently. How has the wet weather... I mean, it's been a deluge pretty much since summer last year. How's that affected your crop this year, if, if anything? Um, I think 2023, first and foremost, was the largest crop the UK has ever produced. Um, I think it was challenging in some areas. Yeah. Other areas did well. Um, the wet weather during the winter, by and large, doesn't have a huge effect on uh, grapes for this coming season. Um, but uh, what we are hoping for, obviously, yeah. is a very, very warm summer. Great. All right, James, Lime Bay Winery. What's the website, very quickly? Uh, LimeBayWinery.co.uk. Okay. And Great. it's absolutely delicious, I can, I it can is. tell you. <laughs> Much needed after today. So just an update on Sydney. Seven dead, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to have more of that with Dawn Neeson, who's next. Thank you at home for joining us. Uh, and Oliver, did you have fun? I had a great time. Thank you very good. much, Ben. We'll see you next week. Dawn Neeson's next. Have a good weekend. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of...